Jain friends, I'm Major Garavari and you are watching the Chanakya Dialogues English. That could be indirectly true, but it's not directly true. Why did you get to the point where you had to take a loan and continuous loans? Why did you have to go into the IMF program for the 22nd time? Poet who once said, Muslim hai hum, vatan hai sara jaha amara. You remember sara jaha se achcha indostan amara? Later on he changed his ideology and he wrote this new thing. Jain friends, I'm Major Garavari and you are watching the Chanakya Dialogues English. Like this video, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon. First of all, heartiest congratulations from all over the world are pouring in and from Team The Chanakya Dialogues, we would like to congratulate Subedar Neera Chopra of the Rajputana Rifles Indian Army for having won the gold in the World Championships. Now, obviously he's a javelin thrower and he's won the gold in javelin. Uh, become the rare breed of athlete who has got both the Olympic gold and the World uh, Championship gold. So that much for Neeraj Chopla. Fantastic. He has gone from becoming simply a supreme sports person to becoming a legend. Now, there is a background story to all this and he belongs to a small village in Haryana. And you know, Haryana is the home of champions. There are, there are Olympians and there are Commonwealth Games and Asian Games and National Games athletes in almost every second village in Haryana. They are just scattered everywhere. That is the culture of Haryana, the sporting culture. So, he belonged to a village in Haryana and uh, getting fat, getting overweight and his father wanted him to run and father wanted him to, you know, shed a little weight, become a little fitter because he was a round and chubby fat kid. So, he told his uncle, uh, you know, Neera Chopra's uncle to take him to a city far away go and ensure that he runs in a stadium. So there was no stadium obviously in the village, a small village. So he went to the city around 20 kilometers away and there Neera Chopra started running. He wasn't very interested in running and then he saw athletes throwing the javelin. And that is where the legend of Neera Chopra starts off. So you know many congratulations, 88.17 meter throw, world champion Neera Chopra, Olympian, Olympic gold medalist Neera Chopra, legend Neera Chopra. Arshad Nadeem came second, Arshad Nadeem from Pakistan and he threw a little less than Neera Chopra and he came second. And I would also like to congratulate Arshad Nadeem. You know, uh, most of our programming, most of our content is uh, Pakistan, China, Ukraine, Russia, Europe, America focused. And we tend to come down very harshly upon Pakistan, which we will also do in the future. There is going to be no letting up. But I would like to take a few seconds and also congratulate Arshad Nadeem and I'll tell you why. I appreciate this guy's spirit, yeah. He's got almost no support from his government. He's got no support from an environment, from his own environment that is. In a country like Pakistan that is obsessed with cricket, there is absolutely no hope and no scope for any other sport. And yet this guy comes second. And there is no shame in coming second if the guy on the podium is Neeraj Chopra. There is absolutely no shame. So my congratulations to Arshad Nadeem too. You, you have been trying very hard. And I hope you do well. This is what I wanted to say to the Pakistani athlete, Rashad Nadeem. Now, uh, another news from Pakistan is, you know, Kakar Sahib, their, their interim prime minister, he is faced with a very typical situation in Pakistan. And his typical situation is that he says that, yeah, you know, people are protesting on the roads. People are beating up electrical company employees who come to cut the meters of those who haven't paid their electricity bills. Yeah. So those employees of the electricity company, they're getting thrashed in the middle of the road. And people are gathering around, mobs are thrashing them in Pakistan. People are burning their bills. Malvis from the masjids, they are saying, don't pay your bills. So this is a sort of a civil disobedience, which is happening in Pakistan. There is no other word for it. Civil disobedience, where, where middle class people are saying, we will not pay our bills. They're just too high. You know, there is another factor attached to it. After Pakistan agreed to all terms and conditions of the IMF, which they had to because, you see, it is not IMF's fault. Many Pakistanis end up blaming the IMF. They end up saying that, you know, it's the IMF's fault. It is actually the IMF that is the root of all evil in Pakistan. High tomato prices, IMF. High educational cost, IMF. You know, high cost of construction, IMF. High electricity and gas bills, IMF. That could be indirectly true, but it's not directly true. Why did you get to the point where you had to take a loan and continuous loans? Why did you have to go into the IMF program for the 22nd time? Pakistanis, you need to ask yourself that. It is finally not the IMF's fault. IMF may be partially responsible, but it is the fault of your leader. So no point in blaming the IMF. Coming back to Kakkad, 
Kakar says, you know, everybody is complaining about electricity bills. Yeah. Everybody is going crazy about electricity bills. People are burning electricity bills. There is civil disobedience. Electricity company employees are getting thrashed, etc., etc., etc. There are cases where a guy's salary is like 30,000 and his electricity bill is 25,000. Now, how does that person survive? How does he feed his kids? How does he educate his kids? How does he eat? How does he get to office and come back? How does he do all of that? And this hardly seems to be the concern of the Pakistani state. They couldn't care less. As far as they are concerned, they have abandoned the people of Pakistan. The Pakistani people were abandoned 75 years back when they became an entity called Pakistan. But this abandonment today is going downhill so fast that it's surprising even for an Indian like me. It's so surprising. You see, they just randomly increase. There is no discussion in parliament, which is why I find it very surprising in Pakistan that there, there is no audit, there is no checks and balance mechanism, there is uh, there is no counterbalancing. Somebody just takes a call and next morning they announce that, you know, the electricity bills are going to be increased by this much and people accept it. It is now that the people of Pakistan have stopped accepting it because people are committing suicide. There have been cases in Pakistan where people have consumed poison, where people have jumped off a high building, high rise. And they've said that it's better to die than to pay these electricity bills because they're getting too much. So this is what is happening in Pakistan. But Kakar, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, the interim Prime Minister of Pakistan says, if you really want to get rid of electricity bills, I have the ultimate solution. Cut off the air conditioning in my house. This is exactly the kind of nonsense that Pakistani leaders have been telling the people of Pakistan. Kakar will not be able to sleep one day without air conditioning. And yet, he comes up with no plan. He has absolutely no plan. He does not have a plan to reduce per unit cost of electricity. He is not talking about generation of electricity. He is not talking about alternate energy. He is not talking about solar or wind. He is just saying cut off the air conditioning in my house. How does that help? How does that help anybody? This is plain simple rhetoric. See, your prime minister also lives without, uh, lives without an AC. So can you. That is the message that he wants to get across to the people of Pakistan. Absolute Top class fraud, this man, Kakar. Again from Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, another news that uh, Iman Mazari and uh, Ali Wazir, uh, Iman Mazari is the daughter of Shirin Mazari, uh, cabinet minister in Ran Khan's cabinet and a PTI member, now resigned. Uh, and human rights lawyer, activist, Iman Mazari, Shirin Mazari's daughter. Iman Mazari was, uh, you know, arrested because of sedition. They said that uh, her speech was seditious. Right. And as far as Ali Wazir arrest is concerned, I don't know why Ali Wazir has been arrested. Nobody in Pakistan knows. He keeps getting arrested every month. Mohsin Dawar and Ali Wazir. I think Mohsin Dawar is still being held somewhere where nobody knows. There is no FIR in his case. It's just ISI. They do crazy stuff like that in Pakistan. So both of them have now received bails. They're out. They're no longer in jail. They're no longer in prison. And they're out. But for how long? The problem in Pakistan is that when you challenge politicians, it's all right. When you challenge the military, uh, you know what she said, Iman Mazari, she said, Ye jo hai, iske piche hai. essentially saying that uh, the Pakistan army is, you know, a bunch of terrorists, which is true, essentially. She's not lying. She's telling the truth. But there are places, you know, where you should not tell the truth. And Pakistan is one of them. So she got arrested. But I'll say this much, you know, uh, being a woman in Pakistan is not easy. It's horrible, right? But this lady, this young lady has the heart of a lioness. I have disagreed many times with her mother and I will continue to disagree with her mother. But Iman Mazari has guts. That much I'll say for her. You know, I remember that video somebody sent me from Pakistan, you know, that video where she's walking up, up the stairs and uh, surrounded by policemen. There would have been a dozen plus policemen, a dozen plus at least. And policemen were there and uh, she just shouted, Ye jo gardi hai, iske piche hai, essentially saying that the Pakistani army, the, the terrorists are the ones who are in uniform, which means that the Pakistani army, alluding to the Pakistan army, and uh, she had the guts to say it publicly, even when she was arrested. Knowing fully well that this is a country where journalists like Arshad Sharif are killed and uh, Imran Riaz Khan is made to disappear. No news, gone, out. This is Pakistan for you. And yet, this woman had the guts, had the gumption to say what her heart felt and her mind believed in. 
Now we'll take you to China, ladies and gentlemen. Interesting news coming in from China. Xi Jinping visited Xinjiang province, the abode of the Uyghur Muslims, East Turkmenistan, as it's known as popularly. And uh, there Xi Jinping says that, uh, you know, we need the sinofication of Uyghur Muslims. Now, what is sinofication? Essentially, they need to become more Chinese. You know, Islam as a religion has a very unique definition. It has a very unique look and feel. Like Christianity has its own definition and look and feel. Like Hinduism has its very unique definition and look and feel. Right? Though Hinduism is extremely fluid and it's, uh, it's layered. It's, I don't want to say that Hinduism is sophisticated and Islam and Christianity are not. I'm not making that point here. But all I'm trying to say is that, you know, Abrahamic faiths tend to be, uh, tend to look like this. Uh, there, is, uh, there is this and there is that and this is black and this is white. Hinduism is slightly different. Okay. Now, the thing here is that Xi Jinping says that there, need, there needs to be sinofication of Uyghur Muslims, which means that they need to be more Chinese than Muslim. In a sense, if I, if I, can, if I can make that sort of distinction in what he's saying now. He's saying they need to be more Chinese. And how do you, how are you more Chinese? You become more communist. Religion is the opium of the masses, is what some great man said long, long back. And this is exactly what the Chinese Communist Party believes, that religion is bad for you. It can be any religion, it's bad for you. Especially if it's Islam. And they have, they have some sort of a hatred for Islam, the Chinese people. So what they do is like anybody, kids who are three years old, four years old, five years old, they are put in re-education camps, which is just a nicer name for a prison, right? If their parents have committed a mistake, kids are put in jail along with their parents. This is what China does. And 1.5 million Uyghur Muslims are in re-education camps for the crime of being born Muslim. There is no other crime, you know. People can be put in jail for naming their children Muhammad. You know, you may name your son Muhammad, you're in jail. You grow a long beard, you're in jail. If you work for the Chinese government and you fast during Ramzan, you're in jail. And you know what these guys did? You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. They found out that dancing and singing were haram in Islam. Eating pork and drinking alcohol was haram in Islam. It was forbidden in Islam. A Muslim will not eat pork. It is not, a, it is not permitted. And while I have Muslim friends who drink like fish, but even drinking is not allowed in Islam. They got all the imams of the vicinity in the town square. They made them eat pork. They made them drink whiskey. They put on music and they made the imams dance. See these images. Go to Google, type dancing imams of Xinjiang province. Dancing imams of Xinjiang province. They were making these imams dance. Because the imams said that it is forbidden in Islam to sing and dance, they said no. What is forbidden? Dancing is forbidden, singing is forbidden, eating pork is forbidden, and drinking alcohol is forbidden. He said, oh, is that so? You'll do all four and you'll do them right now. This is how the Chinese humiliate. And all this is very unnecessary. You reach out to the people, talk to them, and always, I mean, there will be Muslims, there will be Hindus. The idea is to find middle ground. Try and find middle ground. You, you, you see, you can't put people in jail for the crime of eating curd. And you heard that right. They actually put Muslims in jail because they say they eat a lot of curd. They banned curd. Now, of course, they've lifted that ban, but there was a time when they banned the eating of curd. Yogurt, you eat yogurt, you're in jail. The cops come and they, they, they take you away. So this is what Xi Jinping is doing. He's reiterating the fact that you need sinofication of the uh, Uyghur Muslims. And why is he so afraid? Why are they afraid of the Muslims? Because Afghanistan is next door. Afghanistan is next door and China always believes that the next wave of jihadis are going to go through the Wakhan corridor and they're going to go back inside China. And which part of China neighbors Afghanistan? It is Xinjiang. So there are Muslims here, there are Muslims there. And this brotherhood of Muslims across frontiers, across nations, this is something that truly scares the Chinese because they don't understand the concept of transnational brotherhood. Okay. And Islam does not recognize, actually, this is what many Muslim scholars have told me, and I could be totally wrong, but many Muslim scholars have actually told me that, you know, uh, 
the concept of nation states does not exist in Islam as far as Muslims are concerned. And even uh, Allama Iqbal, that great poet, once said, Muslim hai hum, vatan hai sara jahan amara. You remember sara jahan se achcha indosta amara? Later on he changed his ideology and he wrote this new thing. And he says, Muslim hai hum, vatan hai sara jahan amara. Which means that national boundaries do not mean anything for a Muslim. If he's a Muslim here and there is a Muslim there, they are brothers. That is what Allama Iqbal said. Right? And this is exactly what the Chinese are so afraid of. So thank you for watching this video, friends. If you like this video, press like. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon. Jai Hind, Vande Matram, Bharat Mata Ki Jai.